Before diving into the world of quantum computing, I think it will be helpful to do a quick overview of some of the most important concepts used in classical computing. This will help some of you who are very new to the subject to get accustomed to some of the language and ideas behind computing systems. But more importantly, it will allow us also to establish some common notation on how we're going to express binary numbers, how we're going to implement digital circuits, and also highlight the contrast that exists between the classical and the quantum. So let's first start with the fundamental unit of information, which is the bit. And to do this, let's draw a parallel between decimal numbers and binary numbers. So decimal numbers have a fundamental unit called the digit, which can take values between zero and nine. And binary numbers have a fundamental unit called the bit, which can only be zero or one. Now, obviously, we can construct numbers that are larger than this fundamental units by concatenating several of them. So in the case of decimal numbers, we can start from 0, 1, 2, all the way to 9. And then we just add another digit to the left if we want to continue counting, right? So 10, 11, and so on. Now, in the case of binary numbers, we can do exactly the same. We start with 0, then 1, then we do 1, 0, then 1, 1, and so on. So in general, we can express any binary number as a number B of the form B0, B1, all the way to Bn minus one, where this represents an n-bit binary number. And here, each of these elements, B sub i, where i can be zero, one, all the way to n minus one, can only take values of zero or one. So for example, we can have the number one, zero, one, one, where this will be bit zero, bit one, bit two, bit three. So this will be a four bit number, each taking values of zero or one. Now a very important concept when dealing with any number is that of the most significant digit or the most significant bit and the least significant bit. So in our numbers, we call the element most to the right, the least significant bit or LSB for short, and the element most to the left, the most significant bit. And this will become very important all throughout quantum computing. But in this course, we will follow the convention that the least significant bit is always the one most to the right, just like we do with decimal numbers and binary numbers. So a reasonable question at this point is, given some binary number B, how can we find its corresponding decimal number, let's say X? So the way to do this is by taking each of the bits of our binary number and multiplying it by two raised to the power of the location of that bit. So for example, in general, we have x will be equal to b0 times two raised to the power of zero plus b1 times two raised to the power of one plus all the way to bn minus one times two raised to the power of n minus one. Now, it's important that we start getting used to some of the notation that we're going to be using all throughout quantum computing. So the way we express this in a more compact way is by using big sum or sigma notation. So this expression is equivalent to saying sigma of i from zero all the way to n minus one of two to the i times b sub i. So these two expressions are exactly the same. All we do is we replace each of these i's by the values from zero all the way to n minus one and then sum them up. So let's take a look at an example, right? So if we take, let's say the binary number 1101 and we want to find its corresponding decimal number, 
Well, we know that this is bit zero, bit one, bit two, and bit three. So we do two to the three times one plus two to the two times one, two to the one times zero plus two to the zero times one. So that's equivalent to eight plus four plus zero plus one, which is 13. Now, what if we want to do the opposite? What if we are given some decimal number X and we want to find its corresponding binary number B? So we can do kind of the opposite procedure of what we just did here. So instead of multiplying the bits of our number by powers of two, what we're going to do is take our integer number and divide it by powers of two. So let's take again the example of 13 and then let's look at the quotient, which is the integer part of the division and the remainder. And then let's first divide 13 by two, which is six and the remainder is one. And that's just because two times six plus one is 13, right? Then we take this six and then we divide it by two. That's, that gives us three with our remainder of zero. And again, that's because two times three plus zero is six, right? And then we take the three and divide it by two. That gives us a one with a remainder of one. And then we take this one and divide it by two, which gives us zero with a remainder of one. And we stop here because we've reached zero in the quotient, right? And this is our binary number, one, one, zero, one. Right, there's a more compact way to express this. So we can say that our binary number B is equal to the sum from I zero to N minus one, where N is the number of bits we want to represent of our decimal number X divided by two to the I. So basically what we're doing here is we're performing this division. So notice here that we divided by two and then here we divided by two again. So it's like dividing by four and then divided by eight and so on. So what we're doing here is we're dividing from two to the zero, which is one all the way to two to the n minus one. And then we're going to take only the integer part of that number modulo two, which is what's giving us the remainder here of this process. And this is going to give us just each individual bit, but if we multiply by 10 to the i, which is the, the bit number we want to express, it will give us the binary string that we want to get out of this number. And you can go to the textbook and there's an example there if you want to see exactly how this works. But the reason I'm writing this in this way that looks very complicated is to try to get you used to this type of notations that are going to come up over and over again in quantum computing. So I'm trying to show you that all these complicated symbols are simple operations we're going to perform and that you should not be scared of, of long expressions like this and start getting used to them. Now, even though understanding these conversions from binary to decimal and vice versa work, it becomes impractical when we just want to change these numbers uh, for some other setting. So we're going to rely on code to make these changes. And since this is a course on quantum computing using Python, we're going to do it in Python. So let's go ahead and launch a Jupyter Notebook. And for that, we're first going to open a terminal. So if you're in Windows, there will be an Anaconda prompt. And we're going to activate our environment which we called uh, Qiskit Env during the installation video. And then we're gonna launch Jupyter Notebooks by typing Jupyter Notebook. Now this is gonna pop up on a web browser. So let's go ahead and let's create a new Jupyter Notebook file. So in Python, we can represent binary numbers by simply typing 0b. So Python recognizes this prefix and knows that what's going to come next is going to be a binary number. So let's store that number in our variable X, for example, and let's write 1101, which is the 
number we've been using for our examples, which we know is 13. So if we print that, well, we get the decimal number 13. So as you can see, this x is interpreted as an integer. Uh, if we look at the type of that variable, we can see that this is a, an integer variable, not really a binary variable. So we can represent binary numbers in Python this way, but they're always getting stored as integers. Now, of course, we can do other things like adding them. So let's add, for example, the binary number one to the binary number 10. So that should give us 11. So if we print that, we can see that we get the integer 11. So we can use binary numbers uh, this way. Now, similarly, we can turn an integer number into a binary number by using this function bin. So if we pass the number 13, and then let's print that variable b, we get again 0b, which is the prefix that is telling us this is a binary number, and we get 1101. Now, as I mentioned, there's really not a binary type in Python. So this variable b is actually of type string. So this is just a string of characters. So if we look at the type, you can see this is a string. So the problem with this is that we can't really add binary numbers this way. Because if we take, for example, in Python, the string, let's say ABC, and we add it to the string EFG, what we get is a concatenation of the two strings. So if we try to do, for example, the binary representation of five and try to add that to the binary representation of two, we should get seven in binary, which is one, one, one. But if we do that, you can see that you get a long string, which is first a string for five, and then the string that represents the number two. So this is something important to keep in mind. Now, luckily, we can convert strings back into integers if we need to do some sort of operation on this number. So we can you know, represent the binary number five. So let's call it B1. And let's store the binary representation of two and B2. And what we can do here is we can turn that back into an integer value by using the int function. And we pass the variable B. But then what we want to do is specify in which, in which base is this string in. So we specify that this is in base two because it's a binary number. And if we do that, if we print, let's say x1, we should be able to recover that number five. There we go. So then if we were to do the same for x2, and then we add x1 plus x2, we should get seven. There we go. Now, another good thing about this int function is that, again, if we print this number b2, we see that it's a string that starts with this 0b prefix. But this int function actually recognizes the strings even if we don't add the prefix. So let's say, for example, we have the number 13 again, right? So let's save it as a string. Let's call it b3, for example. If I now do int of b3, comma two, I'm specifying that it's base two, is gonna give me the, the right answer, even though I didn't add the, the prefix zero B. And if, if I add it, it, it gives me the same answer, of course. So in most situations, we're going to express binary numbers without using that prefix. Now, having to treat binary numbers as strings has a, a couple of issues. So I wanna highlight two of them. So the first one is, let's say we want to print the binary numbers from zero to seven. And we can do that with a for loop. So we can do for i in range eight. So in Python, this function range is going to generate an iterator that goes from zero to seven. And I can show you that just by printing i. So here we can see it goes from zero to seven. And um, let's go ahead and store in this variable b the binary number or the binary string associated with this with this integer i. And if I go ahead and print that, we can see that one of the issues here is that for zero and one is only using one bit, then when it goes to two, it uses two bits, and then when it goes to four, it increases to three bits. But in a lot of situations, what we want is to always have the same number of bits. 
Now, again, as I said, a lot of times we're going to neglect the prefix of this number. So I can actually do that by storing in B the string starting from the second character on. So if I print that, I get the same, but now without that prefix. And now if I wanted to always have, let's say, in this particular case, uh, three bits for all of my numbers, we can use this function in Python called zfill. And what this is going to do is pad with zeros my string up to whatever number I put in here. So let's say I only want to have three characters in my strings, so I can put a three here. And then all of the strings I'm going to print now are gonna have a total of three characters. Now, if I want, for example, to express up to four, then I can just replace that by four. And obviously, you know, the number seven uh, only needs this three bits, so even that one gets padded with a zero. So this is one of the things that we need to keep in mind when dealing with binary numbers. Now there's a slightly simpler way to do this by using one of the most famous Python libraries, which is NumPy. So we could, instead of having to write all of this, which is, you know, calling this bin function, passing the integer, cutting off the prefixes, and then filling it up with, with or padding it with zeros, what we can do is import NumPy. So, so we do import NumPy as MP, and it's pretty standard to, to use this uh, two characters to, to import this library. And then we can use this function called binary representation, where we can just pass a decimal number and the number of bits we want to include for that number. So in this case, 13, if I add, so in the case, in this case, I'm passing 13 with four bits. So I get the string 1101. So, you know, I could just go and replace all of this in this for loop with this, and it should just give me the exact same result. Now, the second issue is that, as we mentioned earlier in this video, when we're dealing with any number, decimal numbers, binary numbers, the least significant bit is the element most to the right in our number. So in this case, the least significant bit is this one, and the most significant bit is this one. But the way we index things like lists or even strings in most programming languages is that the zeroth element is always the one on the left. So if I were to do, for example, um, let's change this to the number 12. So, so we have our least significant and most significant bits to be different. Let's actually store that in a variable B and print it. And if we were to index this variable B with the zeroth index, well, this is this number, but a lot of times we get confused and we think that we're indexing the least significant bit because usually we express this as B0, this is B1, this is B2, this is B3. But if you print this, you can see that this is the first element on that string, which is the one to the left. So this is something we need to be super careful about. And it is really one of the things that confuses people the most when getting started with quantum computing. But this is not a quantum computing issue per se. It's just that we're used to indexing things from the left when we're dealing with lists or strings. But any number we want to represent has its least significant bit on the right. All right, so I think that's enough for this video. And the next one, we'll start looking into Boolean logic, which is uh, gonna be a very important part of this process that's gonna allow us to then expand those ideas into um, the more general logic we use in quantum computing. Hope to see you in the next one.